Good afternoon. I'm Jane Wales, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, and I just want to welcome you all here. Join Peter Robertson in welcoming you. Um, this is going to be a very dynamic uh, day and a half, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful conversation coming up. But first, I just wanted to to thank our, our council community. Uh, you stepped forward and stepped up and made it possible for 50 students and teachers to, uh, to join us. They come from high schools, from community colleges and universities. Um, and they're here because of your generosity. They'll be here for a day and a half. I hope you'll want to, first I want to thank those who, who made that possible. Uh, and second, I want to welcome the students and, and teachers. I think nothing's more important than investing in the next generation of problem solvers. So uh, it's something, it's a commitment of the council, but as you can see, it's a commitment of, of the council community as a whole. In, in addition to the students, um, I'd like to welcome two new audiences uh, to, to, the, to World Affairs. Uh, the first is our web audience. We are the, the all the plenary sessions that take place in this ballroom are being streamed in web, web streamed in real time uh, around the country and in fact internationally to audiences organized by our 16 uh, partners. And so I want to welcome the web audience and urge the web audience to submit their questions, their questions to us, just as members of this audience will be submitting question cards so that we can pose those questions of each of the speakers. So this is a truly interactive experience. Um, we also want to urge those of you who are here and those of you who are in these audiences uh, that are connected by the web to engage through Twitter. Um, the conference's hashtag is World Affairs. That's World Affairs, and feel free to, to become a part of this, uh, of, of this conversation through Twitter. Uh, second, I wanted to welcome the organizations that are taking part in this evening's Take Action uh, portion of the, um, of the conference. It is a wonderful opportunity to meet with leaders of organizations that are doing extraordinary work on the ground, folks that are working on issues ranging from environmental concerns to the alleviation of poverty uh, to human rights issues. I mean, just the whole panoply of issues that concern folks who, who, uh, who are here gathered today. Um, you're going to have the opportunity to join in a, in a pleasant reception and also an opportunity to go around and talk to each of them and learn about their work. We'll also be uh, putting information about their work up on the, on the web streaming so that um, the whole community will be a part of this, of this conversation. Uh, so please do be with us this evening. I, it's the part that I'm, uh, I think I'm looking forward to most. Uh, and um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our, our opening speaker. Of the many international challenges that we've faced, I think one of the most immediate uh, and the one that's probably captured most of our attention has been the problem of uh, disasters, disaster relief and, um, and post-disaster reconstruction uh, and, um, and development. We're particularly focused on Haiti. Uh, of course, we, there was a, also a, a terrible earthquake in Chile. Uh, but what we have now is an opportunity to focus in on, in fact, both, but in particular the situation in Haiti with uh, Senior Vice President of uh, Habitat for Humanity International, Elizabeth Blake. So, Liz, please join us. Uh, thank you, Jane, and thank you uh, all for giving me the honor. It really is an honor to open your conference. Um, I'm particularly honored because of the title of the conference, Innovative Leadership in the Face of Crisis. Uh, Haiti's just one of the places in the world um, where there is a crisis. But I applaud you for focusing on such a, such a cogent topic. Um, I would posit, though, that Many crises are, um, are unique, but in some ways because of history and divine intervention, um, uh, Haiti's really a crisis like none other. Um, and my, my theory, and I hope you'll agree by the end of my talk, is that innovative leadership 
is exactly what Haiti needs to rebuild. Um, Haiti is a country that speaks Creole, and to rebuild Haiti in Creole is Rabati Aiti. Um, and together, that's exactly what we must do. Um, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're at this conference. You like actually spending your time exploring international issues, and you care about the global issues of the day. Uh, in fact, at the moment at least, most Americans care about Haiti, and they've showed that they care, some because they were impacted by CNN and the photos, others, like me, who were glued uh, to the television when the concert Hope for Haiti Now was broadcast on January 22nd, and the moving musicals of Bono and Taylor Swift and Bruce, Bruce Springsteen um, went all into the evening. Um, people went online and texted and, and gave, um, and in fact, they did what Americans always do, which is to be the most generous people on the earth. Uh, as of last Friday, more than half of the households in the United States had contributed to the Haiti relief, and the American individual contributions had passed $1 billion. In addition, the United States government leads all nations, and our country has already spent $713 million um, on the Haiti Relief Project. There's going to be an appropriation. Sorry, there's going to be an appropriation um, put before Congress. We're not sure what form of the bill, but it's likely to be between one and three billion dollars. Um, we hope it's three billion because repaying and replenishing the 713 million will be the first order of business. But there are likely to be additional funds from our Congress um, for Haiti relief. The governments of Canada, France, Spain, the United Kingdom, Japan, and the EU have been among the top donors. Saudi Arabia has put $50 million designated for Haiti in the UN Emergency Response Relief Fund. And even countries with their own troubles have come to Haiti's aid. The country of Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan has provided $200,000. But Haiti is Haiti, and it's going to take a lot more than just money and a lot of money to solve their problems. I believe it's going to take innovative leadership over a long period of time combined with compassion and commitment, and it's going to take the world working with Haitians to support Haitians to have Haiti rebuild Haiti. But where do they start? They start with the facts after the quake. The Haitian government's estimate of the number killed is 230,000 people. In point of fact, they don't really know how many people have died. That's their official number. But since there's no civil registry of Haitians, they don't know how many people there were and therefore how many bodies. Um, they actually lost count of the bodies, but they don't know subtracting people um, exactly how many died. They do know that more than 300,000 have been injured. And the estimates of the number of amputations um, range from 15,000 to 50,000. Um, when you think about what the solutions are going to be, having a Haitian prosthetic factory is going to be an important um, development. Uh, but before the prosthetics get put on, according to Paul Farmer, who is one of my heroes, he's a Harvard doctor who spends half of his life in Haiti, putting together um, interior health clinics and hospitals, and he's probably made more difference in Haiti than any uh, American. Uh, his estimate is that approximately 30% of the amputations were botched in the first place, and those people will need to have additional operations. There are more than 1.2 billion people who lost their homes. Half of these have fled to the countryside, but they're actually already dribbling their way back because there's no food and no work in the countryside. And the estimate is something between 200 and 250,000 homes were totally destroyed, and 30,000 commercial buildings have been destroyed. I was actually, um, Jane and I didn't get a chance to talk about this. Jane was part of the Clinton administration, but I was actually in New York on Monday um, meeting with President Clinton, who invited those NGOs, non-governmental organizations, working on the ground in Haiti, 
uh, to get together with him to talk about strategic planning. There were about 35 of us. And it was the consensus after two hours with him that the Haitian situation has really necessitated the most complex humanitarian response that the NGO and international community have ever faced. In contrast, you all are in California, and in the last 100 years, there have been six earthquakes in California of 7.0 or greater, which was the size of the Haiti earthquake. In total, for all six of these earthquakes, the loss of American lives was 15. 15 versus 230,000. Closer to Haiti, in Chile, as you know, last month, there was an earthquake. That was an 8.8 .8 Richter scale earthquake. It packed 500 times the energy of the Haitian earthquake, and 800 people died. And most of them died not from collapsing buildings, as was the case in Haiti, but because of a tsunami on the coast. Uh, most of the loss of life was tsunami-related. So as we all look into facing the rebuilding of Haiti, it is important to understand that Haiti is a man-made disaster. Haiti was the first New World country to experience a slave revolt. Actually, the uh, French, um, with their diseases and um, their violence, killed off all natives in that part of Hispaniola. And there literally no one um, who was original to the country um, existed at the end of the French colony. Um, actually, they were unfortunate and had massive diseases and killed off the first round of slaves. And so in the 1780s, the French brought in new slaves. Um, by 1789, the slaves had begun to revolt. And there was a very brutal period of 24 years. Um, but ultimately, these slaves won freedom. When they did so, most of the countries in the, de in the developed world were slave-owning countries. And there was no interest in having the slave revolt of Haiti expand anywhere else. And so the solution to that was a comprehensive embargo. So after the slave revolt, the country trying to get itself on its feet to export sugar, export coffee, export fruit, was frozen out of the world market. And after that, the country of Haiti as an economic entity run by slaves, former slaves, um, collapsed. There, were hundred, there was more than 100 years of political instability and corruption that followed. Um, and even in modern times, the Haitian government has gone through three prime ministers in the last two years, had a president overrun in 2004, has been occupied by the United States twice, and was really in a helpless situation to rebuild after the devastating hurricanes of 2008. Before the quake, these are the facts. 76% of the population lived on less than $2 a day. I've been blessed or cursed as part of my work with Habitat for Humanity to be in slums in, on a garbage dump in Guatemala City on the edge of a riverbank where people live under bridges in the Pasig River in Manila, in Mumbai, and I have never seen the devastation, the, the poor living conditions, the um, enormity of a social problem as existed in Haiti before the quake. 54% lived on less than a dollar a day. 81% of Haitians before the quake did not receive the minimum daily ration of food that's defined by the World Health Organization. 66% of the country had no access to electricity. And 52% of the country did not have access to clean water, basic sanitation, basic health needs, or basic education. The education attainment level in the Caribbean is 80%. In Haiti, it was 50%. And the standard of living from a latrine perspective is a pit latrine in Haiti. And it's 
one hour and ten minutes by airplane from Haiti to Miami, and that's the way 52% of the people live. Because of these stark facts, um, and you think Peter depressed you before, I, I, I hope uh, you're as depressed as I am. Um, before these stark facts, um, because of, excuse me, because of these stark facts, innovation's actually going to be what's going to make more difference than anything else. Um, I love Bruce Springsteen, and I love Steve Van Zandt, and he was quoted in Politico uh, recently as saying that Haiti does not need to be rebuilt. Haiti needs to be reimagined. Think about that. Haiti needs to be reimagined. Um, there's a good basis to do that because virtually all of the buildings, commercial buildings that represented government and established society in Haiti were destroyed. The palace was destroyed, the museum was destroyed, the main cathedral was destroyed, and the presidential palace, or what remains of it, is actually overrun now by squatters. Um, President Preval and President Clinton were side by side in front of the palace three days after the quake. This is what Clinton told me on Monday. And Preval told Clinton that Haiti should not rebuild the palace. He said the Haitians should build a building for the country they want to become, not the country they used to be. Habitat's committed to being part of the rebuilding effort. In fact, Habitat's been in Haiti for 26 years. We actually had a staff of Haitians, uh, 50 people. Um, we had an office in Port-au-Prince, um, and, and we have served parts of the country as far north as Cape Haitian, as far west as Gonaive, um, and as far south as Carrefour. Um, in fact, uh, on January 12th, the day of the earthquake, as on other days, our hours for work at Habitat were 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Promptly at 4.30 p.m., 48 of the 50 employees left the office. 23 minutes later, the quake began and the ceiling started to collapse. Claude Juny, who's the manager of our program in Haiti, with whom I've spent a week of my life, was a charming gentleman, and his admin were still working <coughs> when the quake began. But they followed training, and the blessing is that through the first shock, they waited under a door frame and prayed. And when the first shutters stopped briefly, they stepped out from the door frame as the frame and the rest of the building crashed to the ground. No one could have survived. I'd like to ask you now to take a look at the images of how Haiti looked right after the quake, right after Claude stepped out and was able to save his life. If we could have the first video, please. I think there was audio, and that was part of the video, but maybe we'll go on. Um, Habitat uh, for Humanity has been in the international disaster relief business um, since 1982, and we've been in Haiti for 26 years. So we had a team on the ground within three days after the quake. They actually got there by going through um, from our Dominican Republic um, site in. Um, we had a very able team, and we actually now have a global international team that's in there. Um, they started an assessment immediately. Um, and as they started their assessment, they saw that the hillsides were already covered with tents, pieced together with a mishmash of sheets, blankets, plastic, and scraps. And that was because people were too afraid to go back inside the buildings. In fact, within the first 30 days, there were 52 aftershocks of 4.0 or larger, so um, how wise for them to stay out from under the, under the uh, construction. Um, here's a look at one of the tent cities, and maybe there'll be some audio.
<laughs> I love technology. All right. Uh, um, following uh, any disaster, the first and most important needs, and you saw them documented well on CNN and other, um, the most important needs are um, food, water, and medical attention. Um, and I would add uh, prayer. Um, but once those first needs are met, uh, shelter becomes a critical, critical element um, in dealing with a disaster. Um, in developing countries, that's particularly important, even when there's not the level of devastation that you have in Haiti, because in developing countries, most people actually use their homes, most poor people use their homes um, for their businesses. They'll have a, a bed in the back of their little house, but in the front, they'll sell something or uh, repackage something, usually for the slum dwellers that they live with. So the people of Haiti not just lost their shelter, but they also largely lost their livelihoods. Um, importantly for us to focus on, the rainy season is coming. In fact, it came early, and there have been some devastating rains already that have heightened the misery of tens of thousands of people. Most of them are actually living, the lucky ones are living under tarps, a few in tents, and most of them are living under bed sheets. Um, one of my colleagues down there talked about the devastation that, from her perspective of listening to the mother crying, as she said, against the rain. She could only have two arms to hold one of her children to try and keep the child dry. Um, so she held the baby during the rains. And the hurricane season is starting in June. Um, it runs till November. Um, 2004 and 2008 were huge hurricane years, um, causing massive loss of life and property damage in Haiti. Um, without shelter and sanitation, um, a huge health issue also exists um, of future waterborne diseases. Um, President Clinton said actually that he thinks that that's going to be the most um, impactful backlash that's going to occur because all this aid has poured in and if despite all the aid people are dying anew from new diseases um, in preventable conditions uh, it's just going to make the situation worse. Um, our challenge is to help the families now and also to plan for long-term housing solutions. Um, what we do is, in disaster response is to start with an assessment, then to design and implement um, a program for rebuilding, and to put in monitoring and evaluation. What Habitat is very good at is m mitigation and preparedness, um, because when we put an investment in, when we put our donors' dollars in, we want to make sure that those dollars are not wasted. Um, Cabaret, is, which is a town 16 miles from the epicenter, um, was a place after 2008 earthquakes that we'd actually put 200 houses in. Um, the earthquake hit Cabaret, and the score was one house lost to the earthquake, 199 still standing, and those are the habitat houses. So. Seven had damage, so we're going to be fixing those two, but... Um, what we've learned from the work that we've done is that normalcy, which is what the Haitian people need to start rebuilding uh, a sense of um, pride and, and self-worth and energy to, to rebuild their own economy and country, um, is that sense of normalcy doesn't exist until people have a place to call home. They need a place to go back to. And so it is in the process of rebuilding that we need to work with the Haitian people to have them reimagine a Haiti in which where they live and where they call home is a better home and gives their family a brighter future. In terms of hope, there is hope. And for you that, that wants to get on the internet, um, 19 pages of the best reading I've had was a, a report written by Paul Collier. He's a, he's a professor at Oxford University in the UK. Uh, and he did a study at Clinton's request uh, in January of 2009 on what the blueprint would be for rebuilding Haiti. Obviously, Haiti's in worse shape than it was in January 2009, but the blueprint still is valid and still exists. And he's a professor of economics, so he came with that slant, but what he did was to say, 
Haiti's not going to be rebuilt until there's an economic, there, until the country is not living on first world aid, but in fact is living on its own economic prosperity or progress. So what is it that Haiti can do? And there are two things um, that he identified readily and put together the plan for that Haiti's really good at. The first is garments, and the second is mangoes. Now, as to garments, there's a hope to trade pact which enables Haiti to import cloth at a price that's competitive with China and India. The cloth imported is then finished in Haiti and can be exported for 10 years, which obviously could be renewed, can be exported duty-free to the United States. So Paul Collier has this hopeful blueprint of taking not all the garment folks all around, but creating a center of excellence um, of garment creation and making that a, a source of, the, of jobs. And so he said, don't solve all the problems, solve the problems that are economic engines. And the example was shelter is important, but it ought to be for the workers around the factory. Um, it is important to put electricity in, but don't rebuild um, all the power plants, just rebuild near the factory, uh, etc. And the garments can be competitive. Likewise, mangoes in Haiti are among the best in the world, and, but they now don't get there because they rot before they get to market. Um, so don't build all the roads, just build the mango road. Um, so that's his blueprint, and I, I um, recommend that you read it. From our perspective, as we put our plan together, we are building in job creation. Um, we will be putting cash for work for Haitians um, to clear rubble, to do construction. We will continue to do what we were doing before, which is to teach and train them how to make building blocks. And the design that we have for rebuilding Haiti will involve steel for the frame so that there needs to be fabrication of steel going forward. Um, in terms of what Habitat's plan is, it's threefold. We've actually announced a very bold goal of serving 50,000 families, which is approximately 250 people, which is approximately 25 percent of the people whose homes were totally destroyed. That's the stake we put in the ground. We think it'll take us approximately five years. Um, maybe 10, but we're going to get at it. And we're doing it in three stages. The first is already underway. We've sent 10,000 shelter kits down, um, which are tarps and enable um, emergency shelter, which will help against the rain and is a lot better than a bed sheet. Second, we're doing transitional shelters, which can be either recycled or put permanently on the ground. And these can be done for between one and $2,000 each. And the third we are putting together, which is the core houses. And the core houses are designed to be the beginning of a new home for a family of five. They are 24 square meters, so most American families of five wouldn't live in them. Um, but they would provide an incredible uh, start for the families um, of Haiti that need to rebuild. And I'm hoping that the 3D model <laughs> will show up on the video screen and you can see what a core house looks like, which is designed to be earthquake resistant, and you can see how it could then be added on to. Oh, praise the Lord, there's sound. <laughs>
So that's our plan. Um, you get to see it before it happens. Um, as a community, as a world, as a generous group of American people, we cannot let the headline stage pass and have people in the United States forget Haiti. It's up to people who are leaders like you, innovative leaders, for you to carry on the message and understand it is going to take five years or maybe ten, and it's going to take innovative leaders, leaders like you to have the Haitians learn to rebuild for themselves. There'll be obstacles, planning, central planning is going to be the hugest one, and the second is going to be land rights. You'll be hearing about that, I'm sure, for years. But Haiti needs you, and I'm sure that if you give them your prayers and your support, that together we can be part of reimagining Haiti. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I think it's easy to forget how young an organization Habitat is, that it just was begun in 1976, and it feels like Habitat for Humanity has been there all along for us. So mm -hmm. congratulations for all that has been accomplished. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the massive coordination effort that's involved, and how well do you think the U.S. government has done, for example, in coordinating its response under the leadership of a of a new AID administrator, Raj Shah, but also how well it's coordinated with organizations such as Habitat, because there are a vast number of organizations working together, right. or they could be tripping over one um, another. Actually, it's a little early to tell, um, but there has been um, U.S. support for the U.N. clusters. And so the most successful part of the, re uh, of the um, coordination has been done by UN groups, which is a cluster around health, around water and sanitation, around shelter, um, around medical um, treatments of operations and whatnot. And each of these UN clusters meets between disasters, um, often in Switzerland, and they do the preparation and planning so that there's literally a coordination system in place. Um, second, there's a nonprofit um, umbrella group called InterAction, and interaction sent a person down almost immediately um, to act as a coordinator for nonprofits. Um, USAID is in transition. It has a brand new um, head, and uh, it, he will have a huge impact. I think it's a little early for anyone to have uh, expected that he would have it. Um, but our, you know, our own view is that USAID um, needs to use Haiti as a as a way to rethink the way it delivers aid. Um, it often delivers aid uh, outside of a total community development model. Um, it often does it with large contracts um, and very long terms without the accountability that we'd like to see. Um, and housing and shelter have been um, almost absent in, in U.S. aid uh, contributions over the last five to eight years. Mm -hmm. So we're very much hoping that um, Shah will turn that around. You, know, you talk about the way aid has been delivered, and, and you mentioned the figure 713 million for yes. Haiti. Um, very little of that is spent on local, getting goods from local businesses. Most of that is spent on goods from the United States, That's I right. assume. That's right. Um, w do you imagine a world in which, as we move from relief to economic development in which there will be local sourcing and so that local businesses will be able to thrive just as you suggested in your remarks? Um, I think Haiti's got so few industries that there's going to be a longer time than anyone would like um, before local goods um, are able to supplant um, uh, the imported goods. I'll give you an example. We've been in discussions um, and hope to have a fut future partnership with Semex, which is the largest cement maker in the world. They have a country manager. They have 117 employees in Haiti, but they don't manufacture in Haiti. Um, so it's a good example of they import from within the Caribbean, but they don't, um, they don't uh, manufacture in Haiti. Um, the other huge issue um, is food. Um, the World Health Organization, excuse me, the World, World Food Program is bringing in food, as has the Red Cross and others. Um, but importantly, um, the, the people who are trying to get back on their feet 
by selling food out on the street and whatnot, the carts um, uh, can't sell because the food's still being given to them. So dealing with the transition that needs to occur between um, aid and, and uh, economy is uh, it's a very difficult one. And when President Clinton was talking about it on Monday, um, he's put an enormous amount of money from the Clinton-Haiti Bush Fund um, into seeds and fertilizer and other things, but the Haitian um, soil was largely denuded and deforested, and it's among the poorest soil. So it will it'll literally be decades before Haiti is able, if it started now, to be able to feed its own population through uh, locally grown food sources. And, and the de denuding is really a function of poverty, isn't it? It's been the way in which land has been used. Say, say something about it's that. It's basically been used for fuel. I mean, there's been a fuel shortage in the country for um, decades and decades. And so going farther and farther out, people gathered wood, um, chopped down trees to build their shelters. I mean, if 76% of the people live on $2 a day, they're not living in a house. They're living, on, uh, they're living under some rickety shelter um, that uh, has a couple of wood stanchions and a, and a metal roof if they're lucky. Um, and they have an open fire where they cook. It's incredibly bad for your health. And the fire, the fuel for the fire is, is the wood. So, you know, that's what the people have been living on. And it's um, the country, it, it, if you fly over it, when I, the last time I was in Haiti, I flew from the DR. And, um, and you go up the DR and it, they're separated by the same island, um, Hispaniola, but they're separated. And you fly over one and it's lush and green and kind of reminded me of Peru, these wonderful post-volcanic um, uh, mountains. And then you get to Haiti and it's brown. I mean, it's still hilly, but it's brown. It's just, uh, it's, it's startling. You, you mentioned the, the effect on, on health of, of, uh, of burning these materials, and that's, that's why people are so enthusiastic about supporting cook stoves yes, and, and small exactly. enterprises that provide exactly. safe cook stoves, yeah. um, which brings me to some of these, some of the questioners are asking what they can do to help. Um, in particular, I have a high school student asking what a high school student can do to help uh, with Haitian relief. Um, and someone else who is from the construction industry saying, how can, how can we help? How can those who, who are architects, engineers, right. um, how can we contribute? Okay, those are, th uh, I get three answers. Uh, the first is um, money, 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 and you know, I don't like asking for money, but um, donations are gonna continue to be critical. Um, our relief plan is gonna cost $150 million, and we've got fewer than $70 million identified as poss from possible sources. Um, the second, um, and to be more specific in answering your question, is high schoolers need to become aware of the facts that I shared with you. They need, because they're going to be the owners and partners with Haiti in the future going forward, they need to understand what Haiti's struggling against. And once you understand, then putting together a bake sale or a bike ride or a car wash or whatever it is to raise awareness and funds is an easy thing to do. In terms of volunteers, Habitat's driven by volunteers. We mobilize a million a year, but we're not letting any volunteers go to Haiti because if they are unskilled volunteers, they would take work away from a Haitian. And that would just be, they'd take a bed away from Haitian, they'd take clean water away from Haitian, they would take work away from a Haitian. I mean, it's just the last thing in the world. The exception is skilled engineers and skilled laborers. Um, Unfortunately, the U.S. trades, we are a stick-build country. Um, and if you do a Habitat for Humanity um, project, which I hope you'll all do or get somebody you know and love to do, um, you go out there on the work site with your tool belt and your hammer. And I felt incredibly stupid the first time I got to a Habitat build in a developing country with my hammer. I, I mean, I just, a, a week later, I just laughing and laughing and laughing at myself because they don't, they don't use hammers. It's all trowels and cement and, and, and levels. And I, I mean, it's, it's a concrete block or stucco or bricks made um, in the local community out of the clay in their community. So, um, so not everybody in the U.S. construction business has skills that actually translate into the development there. Who is going to be building those houses that you just showed on the screen? Because I know that the, 
that the model for habitat normally is that those who are going to be, who are in need of shelter, work alongside volunteers. Yes. yes. In this instance, what will be the situation? We'll do that, exactly that. Um, our plan is to take um, and focus on community development and work in uh, Leogan or Carrefour or Cabaret or one of the communities, work with a community group and have them help us secure the title to the land, secure who owns what parcel of land. Um, and that will need to probably be due um, through community mapping. And then have that community help organize the work necessary to build that community. Um, and every person who is an able bodied person will be asked to contribute sweat equity, personal labor, into the, into the rebuilding. Um, we will have cash for work, so to the extent that there are donor funds to do it, we're intending to pay people to rebuild in the communities. And obviously, some of the things being rebuilt will be for the benefit of the whole community, like a school or a community center, um, and we're expecting to pay folks for that as well. And what is the, um, talk a little bit more about the job creation element of this. Do you imagine a whole new set of Masons or others, mm -hmm. uh, folks coming up with a whole new set of skills as a result of Yes, this? in fact, that's what we're committing to do. Um, ha in Haiti, before the quake, we were um, a sub-grantee to CHF on a grant that was building roads. Um, and what our part of the grant was, was to train people to build roads so that when the grant ran out, they would know how to build roads. And so it was our job to work with uh, folks in training. Um, CEMEX has the same program. They, they donate funds to teach people to, um, to do the building skills. Um, and that's one of, part of our commitment. Um, and we're looking forward to hiring a lot of Haitians to help rebuild their own country. You've, we've spoken a lot about poverty. What about government capacity? The government capacity is very, very limited, except in the uh, realm of um, demands and egos. Um, I didn't get to finish my speech because I um, talked too slowly or, or whatever, um, but uh, uh, the NGO community is being decried now, even by the government, as being NGO thieves. And they're furious that billions of dollars are coming to their country or being designated for their country and not flowing through them. And yet Habitat donors, Red Cross donors, whoever it is, are saying, we'll give you the money, but only if you don't flow it through the Haitian um, government. Um, so they had no resources in the first place. And external resources, at least in li liquid cash resources, are not being, it's, in fact, the estimate at best is that one penny of every dollar donated is actually flowing through the government. Having said that, there is actually a plan um, that the Haitian government is going to try to be forced to be in the lead, um, and there's a post-disaster needs assessment that's being done by the European uh, Union and the UN and the Clinton Foundation um, to provide guidance to the Haitian government. Haitian government is creating its own plans. Um, the NGOs are then going to be asked to commit to what they could do to fulfill those plans. And then there's going to be a donor conference in New York on the 31st of March where the blueprint that the Haitian government um, is going to adopt and be supported by the donor community is intended to be put together. And, um, many prayers that the rest of March is, is fruitful in that regard. Let me just ask two more questions because we only have time for that. I wanted to take you to another part of the world because uh, the, the conversation about government capacity takes me there. Habitat was very active in Myanmar, the country that used to yes. be called Burma. Um, tell me something about what it was like working in a country that is so politically and economically isolated. Um, we are no longer in Burma. We are no longer in Myanmar. and. Um, it was because it, it couldn't be a viable program <clears throat> in accordance with our model. Um, we are in other difficult countries. We, go in, we went in post-conflict to Lebanon. Um, we're in um, 23 countries in Africa. Um, so we're in a lot of difficult uh, countries. And, and our view is that um, we are there to act to benefit the, the people. We're not proselytizing. We're not usually fundraising locally. We're just there to, we're, Habitat's a Christian organization, and our, um, our view is that our job is to act upon the teachings of Jesus. And, but, you know, we don't share that with people, and we work in a lot of Muslim countries, but we do not work 
where we are not welcome, and we were not welcome. Did, and what is, you now you've tempted me to another yeah. topic, and that is or a related question, and that is that Jimmy Carter, President Carter, yeah. is very much associated in our minds yes. with Habitat. Yes. Um, because when he first left office, he, was, he, he immediately volunteered. Exactly. exactly. It, did, does the fact that he is such a Human Rights Act advocate, so vocal, uh, for example, on the topic of Burma, does that make life a little more complicated for you? It makes it more complicated and probably most importantly in the Middle East. Every time he makes a statement that is in, it is in fact or is interpreted to be um, pro-Palestine, um, we end up you know, with hate mail and people saying we'll never give to Habitat before because everybody thinks Jimmy Carter started Habitat. Um, he is in fact our best and greatest volunteer. Um, he gives us a week a year and I was talking to Peter before. Um, Peter's wife and I were among 2,000 volunteers and President Carter and Rosalind Carter who spent a week in Thailand building 82 houses in a week in honor of the King's 82nd birthday. And, you know, that's the power that Jimmy Carter um, enables us to bring. We, we actually worked in a Mekong build in five countries. And he allows the, the spotlight of the work that Habitat wants to do to shine because he is so well regarded, if sometimes controversial. <laughs> uh, Millard and, and, and Linda. Um, uh, yes. Fuller founded um, founded Habitat. Uh, they left a very successful business career, they did. a career in the private sector to do it. You left a very successful career. So you were a partner in a law firm. You were general counsel in corporations. What inspired you to leave that behind uh, to devote yourself to service? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I've, I'm sure lots of you have read um, uh, books about the, the transition of trying to have significance. You know. Uh, um, in your life, particularly, I'm, I'm 58, and uh, uh, I intend to work until I can no longer work, but working for things that get me up in the morning and make me work harder than I did at General Electric and harder than I did at U.S. Airways um, is, really, uh, is really a privilege. Um, the short fact is that um, when I was in law school in the 70s, I met a wonderful man, and I re-met him um, about 10 years ago. And um, we courted for a while, having um, married other people and then gone our separate ways. And we re-met uh, about 10 years ago. And after six years of courtship, um, we decided to get married again. And he lived in Atlanta. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's all a guy. Yeah, it, it is all, it's all a guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so. Please join me in thanking that guy and thanking Liz Blake. <laughs>